this is a policy focused panel and we're very lucky to have three excellent participants this morning. So I'm just going to introduce them briefly and uh, after that uh, they'll each speak for 12 minutes or so, give or take, and then we'll open the floor up for, for, uh, for, for questions and, and comments. So, um, so I'm just gonna introduce them in the order uh, that you see them on the program. So uh, sitting uh, immediately to my left is Samuel Pienknogoda. He's a research economist in the World Bank's Office of the Chief Economist for Latin America and the Caribbean. He obtained a PhD in economics from MIT in 2011, and his research focuses on topics uh, involving economic growth and cross-country uh, cross productivity differences, as well as international trade. He's currently working on a range of topics, uh, including uh, firm-level analysis of R&D and innovation decisions, the relation between skills differences and productivity differences, the effect of financial development on growth, and the relation between international trade and volatility. And uh, then uh, immediately to, to his left is uh, Philip Arswald. Um, Philip is an associate professor of public policy at George Mason University. He's also the founding uh, executive director of the Global Entrepreneurship Network, which is an in initiative of the Kaufman Foundation. He's also co-founder and co-editor of Innovations, which is a quarterly journal about entrepreneurial solutions to global challenges. Uh, his most recent book is The Coming Prosperity, How Entrepreneurs Are Transforming the Global Economy. Uh, Oh, and, and, and Iqbal, who's with us today, is, is the other co-founder. So, so we have both the co-founders. <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, so in June uh, 2013, Philip uh, led the launch of the National Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, which is an organization dedicated to using the National Mall, uh, right here in Washington, uh, as a platform to celebrate and support entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, Philip has blogged and written op-eds for, uh, for such publications as uh, the Harvard Business Review, uh, Forbes, the International Herald Tribune, and the San Francisco Chronicle, among others. Uh, and from 2010 to 2013, he was an advisor to the Clinton Global Initiative, uh, focusing on job creation and market-based solutions. And then uh, to Philip's left, uh, we're very lucky to have Harry Broadman. Harry is the CEO and managing partner of Proa Global Partners, which is a boutique uh, global management consulting firm that develops and executes innovative business strategies to capitalize on new commercial, op commercial opportunities while mitig uh, mitigating risk in emerging markets. Ha Harry also serves as a director uh, of Johns Hopkins University's new Center on Global Enterprise and Emerging Markets at the university's Graduate School uh, of Advanced International Studies, SICE, uh, which is also here in Washington. And he's also a senior fellow uh, at the Foreign Institu Institute policy there. Uh, Harry's had a, a long career uh, with many achievements. Um, uh, over this career, he's developed deep, deep expertise in multinational corporate strategy, uh, negotiation of trade and foreign direct investment transactions, private equity deal origination and fundraising, sovereign wealth fund performance, infrastructure project finance, anti-corruption compliance, and economic development policy. So uh, I, I hope uh, you, you, that uh, you'll agree with me from, from these brief introductions that uh, we have three remarkably well-suited guests for the topic of this panel. And I'm going to ask them to speak uh, again, just to, in the order that I introduced them. So uh, we'll start off by turning it over to Samuel, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give you a nod or a wave when, sure. when, when the time's up. Okay, so thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to the organizers, and uh, delighted to be here to talk about this product that we prepared uh, um, last year. So this is part of our uh, research program in the Office of the Chief Economist. This is our, our uh, latest annual flagship report, and it covers the topic of entrepreneurship in Latin America. Okay, so let me start by motivating a little bit about uh, why we came about with this topic. Um, I don't know if uh, many of you know, but Latin America is a region that uh, lags behi uh, behind other emerging markets in terms of growth, and there has been a, a lot of focus on how to ignite this growth potential that the region has. And the problem in Latin America is that we also face some other problems like uh, inequality and poverty and so on. So a lot of the policies that have been designed in the past uh, decades in Latin America trying to boost entrepreneurship are actually designed to target poverty reduction and, and, and informality. So this is one problem that we face. And actually we see that in Latin America, uh, you see the yellow bars over there, um, we have a lot of informal and small businesses, okay? And 
the, 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 the objective of, of, uh, of uh, policy has been to try to formalize these people, to make them formal and then grow. In our study, we claim that informality is not necessarily a problem of smallness. Actually, smallness is also observed in Latin America in formal businesses. So actually, the problem that we face in the, in the Latin American region is that formal and informal businesses are not growing at the speed that policymakers would like in order to create good jobs, formal jobs, good paying jobs, right? Um, and we actually see that to reduce informality, at least uh, a simple scatter plot shows that the largest increases in informality in Latin America have occurred in countries that have incremented the number of formal jobs. So we claim that actually a better solution to deal with informality is to help or create an environment in which formal, medium, and big firms grow faster and are able to create more well-paid, uh, good jobs, like we call them, okay? So basically, what we try to argue in favor of is to try to deal the problem of entrepreneurship as a problem of entrepreneurship, and that this will, in turn, lead to better paid jobs and formal jobs that will actually give the incentives to people to leave the informal sector. Okay, so basically what we say is that in order to deal with informality and smallness, you have to be able to make these big firms grow at a faster pace. <clears throat> and here, when we talk about entrepreneurship, uh, I mean, in, in academia, many people, or, or at least in policymakers, uh, in, in, the, in the minds of many policymakers, when they talk, talk about entrepreneurship, it's just the act of creating a firm, right? In Latin America, when you ask someone, are you an, an entrepreneur, he will, he will respond, uh, positively if he has opened a firm. But what we claim is that entrepreneurship, and I'm, I'm sure many of our guests here and, and panelists will agree with me, entrepreneurship is a much more diverse and, and, and multifaceted object, right? It's the act of introducing new things, basically, as Schumpeter will, would uh, define it. And by newness, we, we mean a lot of things, new products, new processes, new markets, and so on and so forth. So we try to kind of look at this multifaceted aspect of entrepreneurship in Latin America. So we're not gonna just focus on, 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 on firm creation, we're also trying to look at all these different angles that we uh, think are relevant for, for growth of uh, firms. And why, why we care about these uh, medium and big firms, as I was arguing earlier, uh, when you look at the differences in how these firms uh, behave compared to small firms, we see that these are actually the firms that paid higher wages, that in introduced new products. So there, there are many dimensions in which these firms are the entrepreneurial firms in, 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 the, in the market, right? So it's not like we, that, that we are uh, saying that small firms should be neglected in any way, but we think that in order to focus on the, on the, on the, on the issue of growth and, and, and creating uh, good jobs, so well-paid jobs and with uh, certain uh, properties, uh, we believe that it's important to, to foster the growth of medium and uh, big, big firms, okay? And we have a couple of uh, messages that we like to convey to people. Uh, and I'm talking in, in plural because this is the product of not only my work, but also some co-authors uh, uh, and, and some contributors, so uh, I just want to say that. <laughs> um, and we have a couple of messages that we are trying to um, that, w that we'd like to, to mention because we think these are the relevant things that we want to, people to take away from this work that we did. And the first thing is that in Latin America, there are a lot of small firms. So smallness is a, is a, is a big problem in Latin America, okay? And as I said, <coughs> the problem of smallness is not necessarily at birth. The problem is that firms remain small throughout the, their life cycle, okay? So here we have a simple... Uh, a simple uh, illustration of this problem that we see is uh, present in Latin America. We see that in Latin America, the size at birth, the number of employees that firms have when, when they're born, it's, well, a little bit smaller than in other emerging regions and in high-income countries, but it's not necessarily that big of a difference, okay? So it's 80% that of uh, high-income countries, more or less, give or take, or Asian firms. The problem is that after 40 years, when we observe these firms uh, survive, 
the differences magnify, right? So they grow. It's not that they're not growing, but they grow at, at a much smaller, slower pace than their counterparts in in uh, ECA is Europe and Central Asia. EAP is the Asian economies the in the the, the high income. The, sorry, the middle income Asian economies and high income countries are the rest of uh, European and, and North American countries. Okay, so this this is when you see the problem in a, in a bigger scale. Okay. And as I said, it's not that Latin America doesn't have firms create, uh, sorry, firm creation. Actually, we're a, we're a region where there's a lot of firm creation, okay? The problem is that this firm creation is not accompanied by paid jobs, okay? So, as I said, in Latin America, more or less, the, number, the share of people that own a job, sorry, own a firm is more or less similar to other uh, high income and emerging regions. The problem, as I said, is that we don't have enough, um, sorry, let me skip this. We don't have enough paid jobs, people who are salaried, workers, okay? That's where the deficit in Latin America is flagrant. And the problem, as I said, is that firms are not growing at a sufficiently fast pace to create all these opportunities, okay? So in the, in the book, we, we, we make the case that the problem is that if you look, you have these two types of entrepreneurs that you can think about. One are those that have great ideas, the Steve Jobs of the world that have a great idea and decide to open a firm. But we, what you observe in Latin America is a lot of survival entrepreneurship. That's what we call it. And, and, and this survival entrepreneurship is present because there are no sufficient well-paid jobs to absorb all this labor force, okay? So that's the second message, that these big firms, the ones that are supposed to create these well-paid jobs, are not doing their, 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 their job, okay, to, some, to put it some way. And then we try to look at, well, let's see where are the, the missing elements in Latin America, why we're not growing, what, what fir, why firms are not growing at, at a sufficiently fast, a fast pace. And we see that there are deficits throughout, okay. We see that they don't... Uh, perform well in in, uh, in uh, introduction of new products, which is this graph here. Uh, R and D is also lagging in Latin America. We perform very poorly compared to other emerging regions, and management practices are very uh, poor compared to other regions. Okay, there are these indices that um, Nick Bloom and other academics have made, trying to quantify management practices, and we see that lat the Latin American firms that are in the sample compare very poorly relative to other to firms in uh, developed countries, okay? So it's not that we're, uh, Latin America is performing badly in some dimensions. It's performing badly in many dimensions. And this is keeping behind, uh, this is uh, pushing behind the growth rates of uh, these firms in Latin America and preventing them from creating the types of jobs we think are relevant for, uh, to reduce informality. So, the next step we try to, 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 uh, to take is to look at the, the superstars, the, the, the firms that are supposed to, to shine above all these massive firms, because so far we were looking at the average firm. And these superstars are exporters and multinationals. And what we see is that exporters in Latin America perform relatively uh, uh, worse than firm, that exporters in other countries. So the entry rates into new markets is lower in Latin America than in other emerging markets. We see that multinationals in Latin America tend to perform relatively worse than other multinationals. So these are the multinationals that come from Latin America. So the, the Chilean multinationals that go abroad. And what, what we see is that they invest less in R&D than other multinationals in the same sectors as they operate. And they have uh, lower uh, levels of managerial quality. Okay, so they, they have worse HR practices, they have worse uh, quality control in their processes, and so on and so forth. And the multinationals that come to Latin America, so the American multinationals that come to Latin America, re react or, or behave differently than when they go to other emerging regions. So in Asia, for example, they tend to introduce newer products or, or products that are more innovative than when they go to Latin America. Okay? So, there are a lot of conclusions that we take from these observations. And one of them, based on the last finding, is that it's not necessarily that the firms, that the Latin Americans are different, 
they may be in some dimensions, but it's not necessarily the case that only the firms that are created by Latin Americans behave in this uh, rather uh, poorly way. It's more the environment that they face that is pushing them to behave in this way. And that's the evidence is that these multinationals that come to the region are also have this, uh, this problem. And we claim that there are at least three big ticket items that we think are relevant for this, uh, for this behavior. One is the, low of the, the lack of competition in the region. The region is very service oriented and there's a lot of, um, of uh, forces preventing competition in these service, in these service sectors. The other thing that we see is very relevant is this, the, the lack of human, the right of human uh, capital in the region. So there have been a lot of uh, efforts to uh, expand uh, um, education throughout the region, access to education, but we see that there's a mismatch between the, the, the type of, uh, of uh, skills that firms are looking for and the type of skills that universities are producing. And uh, while well, when, when presenting this job, this, uh, this, uh, this, this book, I think this became very evident for us. And the third thing is the contractual environment. Okay, the contractual environment in Latin America is very uncertain. Even in, in, in countries that, are, that have made a, a big strides in terms of solidifying the macroeconomic stability and so on, there are still some uh, forces that prevent firms from having the kind of certainty that uh, entrepreneurs uh, would like to have. So, sorry. So these are the, the, the three things that we we think are relevant. And again, it depends on the countries. It depends on the on the on the on the environment uh, that each country faces. But we don't want to prescribe things. These are the th the three the, the three things that we thought policymakers should try to tackle in going forward in order to boost this growth of entrepreneurship. Thank you. All right, well this is actually a perfect lineup because uh, what I'm gonna be doing is essentially generalizing from Samuel's talk. Um, and uh, my first slide, which will be up in just a moment, um, is um, what I'm um, sort of thinking about as the, the watermark for the difference between rich and poor countries. And again, it follows immediately uh, from Samuel's talk. Um, and um, just not to waste time as they're sort of bringing up the talk, I'm gonna describe the, the slide to you. Um, and so it is a, uh, a bar graph of, of rich and poor countries. Um, and in the rich countries, uh, what we see is an economy where a large part of the economy, whether we measure by employment or GDP, is comprised by, by large firms. So sort of depending on whether it's employment or GDP, 25%, 37%, something on that order of magnitude. And then we see a large part of the economy Economy, comparably large actually or even larger comprised by formal small and medium enterprises. Now, um, as Samuel was pointing out, we're not in inherently interested just in small, medium em enterprises. We're actually interested in entrepreneurship. But as also Samuel pointed out, it's very difficult to be a growing firm unless you're at least formal. So we're going to use this as a kind of proxy for the time being. Um, and then you see a very small number, a relatively very small number of informal firms. Um, in poor countries, you see um, sort of a similar number, similar comparable number of, of, uh, uh, of, of large firms, um, but you see uh, relatively fewer, almost no, um, uh, sort of on the 15% as opposed to 40% uh, of formal uh, small and medium enterprises. And then you see uh, a large uh, sex, uh, section of the economy, a large fraction of the economy that is, that, that, that is informal. So, um, the way that I want to sort of think about this in a generalization, and the way I present this, I'm sort of giving this to a friendly audience where sort of all of you, uh, you know, I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, believe and in, in, in have no doubt in the importance of entrepreneurship uh, in, in development. But, but the, the, the way I try to think about it is um, that, you know, we talk about multiple sectors in the economy, right? So you might have the energy sector and uh, you might have the health sector, education sector. Um, I want to suggest that there's really just one sector in the economy, and that's the forest sector, okay? And we're going to have a, a slide of the forest sector in just a minute. I do need to have a forest sector. So they, hold on, pause, shift, shift back one second. 
just so we can see. That's what I was talking about, okay? Low, low, uh, low income country on the left, high income country on the right, and it's this contrast, and just as you see, uh, contribution from formal SME sectors in rich countries is sort of three times what it is in poor countries, and I'm gonna suggest that this is a watermark for poor versus rich countries, and it's perfectly consistent with what we just heard from Samuel. Okay, next slide. So what do, we have, what do we have in the forest sector? The forest sector is very interesting. I mean, any of us can kind of relate to the forest sector. From the sky, you only see the canopy, right? You see Walmart, you see GE, uh, you know, you see Boeing. It's that, and, and really, it looks like from, from, from a distance, it looks like that's all that the economy is. And of course, that gets the sunlight. All the sunlight first comes to the canopy. But in fact, that's not the entire forest. There's a lot in the forest that you don't see from the sky. And, and one thing you don't see is that scrub in the bottom. Right, and, 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 and so the scrub in the bottom, uh, there's actually a lot of biomass in the bottom. And, and that's small business, and it's informal small business in particular, but it's the small business that's not growing. Um, what's important, obviously, to the economy is that middle sector, right? It's that middle part of the forest where it's small and growing. And, and, and why is it important? Well, what the middle sector does is something very significant, right? It takes resources that are available in the economy, often because of the collapse of the old, and reorganizes them into something that's of new and of value. And one of the things that happens when something that's old collapses, particularly in the rainforest, is it opens up some space in the canopy. Some sunlight comes through, and that gives an opportunity for the, the, for the new and growing firms to reach for that canopy and to challenge the old, right? So, 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 so in some sense, when we think about the ecosystem, it is this sort of new and growing firms that reorganizing resources and that, that challenge incumbents that are the, the, that are the, that are the water of a, vi a vital economic system, okay? So now second metaphor, ecosystem metaphor, now recipes metaphor. Now this is an astounding thing. Um, human beings have been preparing meals for pretty much as long as we've been human beings, um, but, but remarkably, uh, you know, although 100 million people, I'm uh, sorry, 100 billion people uh, more or less have ever lived, all of whom have somehow had to eat every day, and many of whom prepared their meals in one manner or another, and we've been doing this with more or less a fixed set of ingredients. In fact, if you think about mono culture and sort of the ways that uh, global food markets have evolved, we're, we're arguably, arguably using fewer ingredients today than we were 40,000 years ago. Um, but, 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 but despite that fact, we have people who not only can come up with new recipes, new ways of preparing meals that have not been conceived of before, but you can actually make money doing it. In fact, you can make quite a bit of money and you can become quite famous. Just a little, uh, you know, a few blocks from here, we have Julia Child's Kitchen in the Smithsonian and Jamie Oliver is doing pretty well. There's a, we're in the age of celebrity chefs. And this is, this is after 100 billion people experiencing a fifth set of ingredients uh, for, for, for millennia. Um, so, so actually, uh, recipes, encoded recipes, go back as far as writing itself. This is a Sumerian tablet. This is a beer recipe. So we've not only been creating recipes, we've actually been writing them down and sharing them for as long as writing has existed, and yet we have new recipes. So how does this happen? Well, it actually happens uh, through incremental innovations of different types, but also through combinations. This is a combination, this is a new combination in the recipe space, spaghetti tacos. So once you have tacos and once you have spaghettis, then it's natural to have spaghetti tacos. I'm sure you've all enjoyed spaghetti tacos at one point or another. But the power of combinatorics is really quite remarkable. I mean, if you take six eight-studded Lego bricks, um, you know, just think about them, you know, it's, it's not very much out of the entire Lego, six, uh, uh, entire Lego set. Six eight-studded uh, Lego bricks can, uh, can be combined in over 900 million ways. Okay, so, so, so the, power of, the power of entrepreneurship is really the power of combinatorics. Now I'm gonna to shift to policy. So there's a number of things that people believe to be true that turn out not to be true at all. Um, one of them from an economic standpoint, and this is, this is only really for the economists in the room, but the thing is this filters through the analytic frameworks, it filters through the policy recommendations. Entrepreneurship is one factor among many in an economy-wide aggregate production function. There's all kinds of good things in the economy, and we, one of them we wanna have is entrepreneurship, because that's a nice input, um, sort of you know, capital, labor, which are sort of managerial talent. We're going to throw it all in there. And, and if we don't have enough of it, we should sort of boost it up. Okay, well, well Schumpeter's view, we already had Schumpeter in 1911. I'm saying Samuel and I are like, we're like twin brothers. We just given the same talk, but, but sort of in a different way. Um, you know, the carrying out of new combinations we call enterprise. The, interview, the individuals whose function is to carry them out, we call entrepreneurs. And, 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 and so, so, so new combinations, this notion of entrepreneurship as new combinations, entrepreneurship is 
a combinatorial activity is fundamental in Schumpeter. Now, we also talked about management practices. So where do management practices fit in economics? Well, we have a model in economics of production that's about linking inputs. Inputs, there are the inputs. We're making chocolate chip cookies to outputs, the number of cookies you make, right? And this is, makes perfect sense. You can't have uh, chocolate chip cookies not just with the inputs listed here, but with an oven, some bowls, so forth and so on, capital equipment, so on. But one thing that we have in any recipe book, and I defy you to find a recipe book in any store anywhere that does not have this other element here, which is what you do with the recipes, right? It's the, it's, it's the how. It's the how of what you're doing. And the how of what you're doing is today, and I'll just shortcut somewhat to the conclusion, five-sixths of the economy. Intangibles are five-sixths of the economy, where only 40 years ago they were one-sixth, okay? We have an economy that is almost entirely the how, the how you do it, and yet the way we think about it is still in the 1930s framework of optimizing inputs to yield and output, okay? So what does that mean? Entrepreneurship is actually not a factor in a fixed aggregate production function. The model of the 1930s, our production model of the 1930s worked very well for a modern times world. It does not work at all well for a 21st century world. And entrepreneurship is actually a, the process of creating firm, new firm level production recipes that can be themselves represented as production functions. They are, it is the essence of production functions themselves. Okay, another one, another one. This is a favorite. Entrepreneurship depends on a favorable business climate or the importance of institutions. Until we have the right institutional framework, forget about entrepreneurs doing anything useful because they really need an institutional environment that's favorable. Well, this is a Manifest Destiny. This is the 1850s in the United States. We have the uh, covered wagons crossing, and I tell you one thing: they did not go west in search of better governance, right? What they went west for is in search of opportunity, and that's where people go. That's where people move. They go in search of opportunity. Now they may flee terrible gov governance, but. Afghanistan, there's opportunity. Roshan, our, my Iqbal and I published the case in Roshan a number of years ago. The Afghan cell phone company, wonderful success story. There's opportunity in the mobile space, as, as Iqbal talked about, and that's global. And the place where the opportunity is, is where the markets are underserved, and that's the story of Grameen Phone as well. Okay, so entrepreneurship, no. Entrepreneur, a favorable business climate depends on entrepreneurship. And exactly as Iqbal said, it's entrepreneurship who do, that distribute economic opportunity, that distribute economic power, and then that distributes distributes political power and creates better institutions. Um, if entrepreneurship generates positive syllabus and thus is an undersupplied input, then what we really should do is subsidize educational institution to increase their production of entrepreneurs. Nothing against the University of Maryland. I teach at George Mason. Entrepreneurship programs are proliferating. Everybody loves entrepreneurship, so we need to train some more entrepreneurs. Okay. Well, you know, w w there's a friend of ours, uh, Mary Walshock, uh, who, who, who in San Diego just after uh, the federal government uh, rather sharply cut uh, spending on on, on uh, military R&D in the region. San Diego had been very dependent on the military. Um, you know, they came up uh, with, with something called UCSD Connect, which was really about the relational infrastructure of the region. Anyway, she also wrote for Innovations Journal, my experience working in a community that completely reinvented itself over a 30-year period that suggests that accelerating entrepreneurship is, about com is as much about community transformation as it is about helping individual entrepreneurs. That's the reason the title of this talk is Enabling Entrepreneurial Ecosystems. It's an ecosystem approach. You can't just push people out and say you're going to have more entrepreneurship. So no. Entrepreneurship uh, uh, p uh, policy potentially can increase economic vibrancy by enabling entrepreneurial ecosystems, but doing so is not as simple as merely subsidizing the production of an undersupplied input. Okay, principles, just to close out. Number one principle, there's really actually usually just have one because it's simpler just to have one, but I'm going to do six because I have six in the paper. It seems like it was cheating just to have one. But um, there is absolutely no point in having ten programs, and I'm not going to pick on any particular national organization or funding organization, 10 programs that are structurally designed to favor incumbents. They're structurally designed to push contracts to whoever has political and economic power, and then having one, uh, one entrepreneurship program. There's absolutely no point to that. Right? We're, pushing, we're pushing water downhill on the entrepreneurs, and then we're teaching, giving them some swimming lessons. Right? That's not, that's, not what, that's not what entrepreneurship policy is about. And just exactly as Samuel said, uh, one of the elements he talked about, I think it's a very important uh, element, and it's exactly what keeps the big trees propped up when they really should be following and falling and releasing the nutrients to create new entrepreneurship, is competition. Competition policy is the most un important policy for entrepreneurship. And unless we have competition policy that, 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 favors, that at least favors incumbents less, 
that at least reduces the, the, the cost of entry for entrepreneurs in markets, not just by business registration and all that, but all of the structural factors, registration, complexity of regulations, all of these things that impede entrepreneurial entry. Second one, I mean, the rest of these are actually much less important than the first one, so that's why it's bold-faced. So uh, listen to entrepreneurs. You know, this is a simple thing. If you're creating a policy, amazing the number of times this does, or if you're creating a policy for smallholder farmers, we have mobile phone surveys. I mean, it's amazing the number of times that we don't make use of the mobile phone as an input device. So listen to people who, we know this, you know, this is not so much news. Map the ecosystem, know who, know, know what kind of an environment you're working in. Um, you know, this is just standard, you know, sort of entrepreneurial mindset stuff. Think big, uh, start small, move fast. But again, from a policy standpoint, it's not that easy to implement. Uh, remember that participants in the entrepreneurial ecosystem are not potted plants. It's an organism. They will move. They're going to do things you don't expect, ex uh, anticipate that. And actually uh, support it, uh, get behind it, and then prepare to capitalize on crises. And, and there's a whole separate talk that uh, one can give about the way in which uh, crisis is actually what mobilizes entrepreneurship. But there are examples, whether we go from, from, from China to, uh, to Rwanda to uh, San Diego in the 1980s to uh, Silicon Valley in the 1950s that was also subject to very sharp defense cuts. I mean, over and over again, we see that what works to build entrepreneurial ecosystems, at least in rich countries, is spend heavily in the federal government particularly a military R&D in a certain place, and then stop suddenly. Okay, if you do those two things, but you must stop suddenly and panic the heck out of people, and you will see what happens to the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So it's really more the story of stone soup. I'm sure you know the entrepreneurship story, uh, policy is less about design and implementation and evaluation and fancy stuff. It's more about stone soup. It's about basically create a setting where people come together. What you put in is less important than the convening power to get the energy of an environment and to make the most of the resources that exist. So I've really gone two minutes over my 12. But anyway, that's Well, I, I, I've learned the lesson not to use slides since I, I know economists never are able to get them up in time. And, <laughs> and, and I admire how quickly uh, the presentation was given. I'm from New York, and I can speak quickly, but you, you put me to shame. It's very good. <laughs> and, and, ma and made a lot of sense, nonetheless, which is very rare. Um, th thanks uh, you know, for having me, and I apologize that I wasn't here this morning to hear uh, some of the early remarks, and maybe what I have to say overlaps with, with those remarks. Uh, so if, if they do, uh, please accept my apologies. I want to make sort of four points thinking about entrepreneurship within the context of, of emerging markets. Um, and these four points uh, you know, were, were generated through, through correspondence with, with Bennett for things for us to think about. Uh, but they naturally are things that I've been working on in fits and starts, uh, both in the private sector and at the World Bank, and then earlier as an academician and policymaker. You know, the, the first, the first sort of question, and I think we've been, we've been dancing around this to some extent, is, is entrepreneurship uh, or entrepreneurs in emerging markets, and by emerging markets I'm referring to all developing countries, you know, starting with all due respect from a South Korea down to a Burundi, just using the IMF World Bank definition. Are entrepreneurs in emerging markets, you know, very different, fundamentally different from entrepreneurs in the advanced countries? And, you know, as, as I think about, you know, this notion that, you know, the Bill Gates, the Steve Jobs, uh, you know, starting in, in their garages, well, maybe in emerging markets there aren't garages, but it's often someone with, with a bright idea. And in, in many cases, uh, that bright idea can come about from, from, from a multitude of ways, and that's not unique to advanced countries. Um, I mean, at, 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 at the root, I think a successful entrepreneur who is able to uh, create an invention, diffuse it to an innovation, and then you know, sell it you know, more as, as a commoditized um, item, uh, the, the real crux there is access to markets or access to buyers, right? And this access to buyers could be physical, uh, you know, infrastructure, access to roads, whether it's by, or trails, whether it's by horse or car or railroad. Um, but there's also, I think, one of the differences with 
emerging markets versus advanced countries in, in the access to market question, apart from sort of the hardware, which is what I've just referred to in terms of infrastructure, is the, what I would call for lack of a, just to keep the analogy right, sort of the software. You know, and we talked a little bit about com, you know, competition policy. Well, in many emerging markets, in, in some cases, although only recently we're seeing that in the advanced countries, there is a competition policy that's beginning to work. Um, the competition policy regime or the notion of vested interests in emerging markets, which tend to be quite rife, given the fact that these markets are nascent by, by definition, they may well be a serious impediment to entrepreneurship becoming you know, as successful as it may be uh, in, an, in an advanced economy. And it also may be the case in another part of, of, of the, the software impediments uh, in emerging markets for entrepreneurship, you know, stems from, you know, by extension, sort of regulatory barriers and, and the like, or, or, or the lack of regulation to protect property rights and so forth. But, I, for, but for me, I think the big point, uh, and, and I've been writing a little bit about this over the last couple of years, is the notion that entrepreneurship begins only in advanced countries, as Ray Vernon you know, wrote about many, many decades ago when I was in graduate school about the product life cycle. That notion is being turned on its head. The notion of the product life cycle is that it's the advanced countries that are the homes to inventions. Uh, as the home country market becomes saturated, and as there are refinements to the product, it becomes a little bit dumbed down into an innovation and it makes its way to middle income markets. And you know, over time, as Ray would say, it goes to a very commoditized item and penetrates the emerging markets. And that is one of the theories of multinational corporations and innovation and the like. Well, what we're seeing, uh, and thank God it's happening in my lifetime, is that that model is being flipped on its head. So the, the, the archetypical example is mobile money, okay? And, you know, for those of us who work in emerging markets and, and, and development, you know, we're very uh, clear about when the M-Pesa, you know, in Kenya was, was invented, um, you know, almost, almost a decade ago. And we get a chuckle, at least I get a chuckle, when I see all of a sudden Apple, you know, and Google, you know, is beginning to create a smartphone, uh, you know, with the ability to pay for things. Well, it's very difficult, it's been very difficult actually for several years to take a cab, a taxi, in Nairobi and use cash. I mean, you, you know, it's, it's, it's an economy that is driven by the use of the, of the mobile telephone. And it's essentially a bank in your pocket. Now, that was not created in the United States. It was not created in Europe. But all of a sudden, we think, oh my god, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. But it's a very powerful example, either by dint of necessity in the emerging market context, where there wasn't that capability before, and uh, engendered by the fact that there is no legacy technology that is a vested interest, in essence, that's standing in the way. There's not, a, there's not an obsolete, uh, lots of sunk costs, uh, legacy technology. And when, you're, when you face an environment where there's a demand and that there's their absence of someone who's going to get in your way, whether it's the government or other uh, actors, uh, all of a sudden that becomes a, an environment for, for invention. And so there are many other examples of inventions making their way backwards from the emerging markets to advanced countries, and, and I think we're just at the beginning of a trend uh, in that way. Now, in the end, it's, there's going to be a convergence probably, but we can talk about that you know, uh, separately. But I think the question of whether entrepreneurs in, in emerging markets are different from advanced countries, I mean, for me, the ultimate answer is not a lot. Right? in the reduced form context. The second point is, you know, does, does the acceleration of globalization in the last two decades, the notion that globalization you know, just started two decades ago is I think most of us would agree as a myth, but is that, is that the, the new environment, if you will, of accelerated globalization, how does that affect 
entrepreneurship in, in emerging markets. And put aside the product lifecycle stuff that, that I was just, just talking about, um, you know, clearly the advent of the web is making less of an information impactedness problem as long as people in emerging markets have access to the web. And again, if you think about the mobile money problem, there's not the legacy. So all of a sudden you're seeing fiber optic you know, cables in many emerging markets. I live, I live in Georgetown. There's never going to be fiber optic there you know, through my lifetime because they're not going to dig up the street. Okay? Um, so, so globalization is really helping in, in, that, in that regard, assuming that there's free access or, or, or easy access to, to the information flows. But does that mean that globalization means that entrepreneurs in an emerging market should behave differently than before? Well, I think in one respect, yes, that they're going to be, they're going to be have greater access to understanding what's going on in other markets around the world. So, you know, the, the notion of an Uber that, you know, for all practical purposes was, it, was invented in, in, in advanced countries, but you can now see it in, in, in emerging markets. That fact that we're able to be connected, the information flow becoming more efficient means that entrepreneurs, yes, you know, on the margin are going to, to behave differently than maybe in, in, in earlier um, you know, periods of time. But I do think, again, the bottom line for me on the globalization question is at its root, entrepreneurship, at least over, over history, shows that success at home breeds success abroad. And so it's not like all of a sudden we're in a global market and sort of an entrepreneur think globally from the get-go. I think the lessons from history are that's probably a mistake, and you need to think about, okay, how can I make a go of it? How can I be successful? The best firms or the best entrepreneurs in the domestic market become the best and the fiercest competitors in the broader uh, inter international market. So in that respect, I don't, I don't see you know, fun fundamental differences. I think the third point I want to make is, just, you know, apropos of the theme of this panel, is, is the role of government or you know, policies, and you know, do they need to change? Well, I think we all, we, you know, apart from the technological changes, we sort of know what needs to be done in an economy to foster innovation whether it's on the, on the education side, whether it's the reducing barriers to access to markets, which I spoke about earlier, but also having regulations that protect the health and safety of the population from innovations or inventions or entrepreneurship that someone makes in their garage in, in uh, you know, Abidjan, and all of a sudden it's, it's endangering the health of the citizens, so you want to make sure that, that, that there's uh, regulation in place there. So I think, again, all those kinds of policies that have been practiced over time in advanced countries or emerging markets, that, that I think, you know, doesn't, has not changed and, and, and should not change. But I do think this question of access to information and the provision of particularly access to the web is a public good, just like education is a public good. And so there, to me, there's a vital role for government, particularly, particularly uh, in emerging markets, uh, to help ensure that you know, this, this is being provided. And if, if the private sector is not going to do it, which is probably not, or through a public-private partnership, you know, it's going to be government's role. And I would say that, that, that you know, as a, as a, as a, as a, if I were a government uh, representative in emerging markets, that's like number, number one policy apart from the, the human training issues. And then finally, I think, which is, which is addressing a lot of the work that I've been doing recently is the social impacts of an entrepreneur in emerging markets. Is it different from you know, the John Rockefellers, if you will, who were not really care, cared about social impacts other than trying to, you know, sell as much oil as, as, he, as he could and uh, killing rivals. In, in emerging markets, there's often sort of killing two birds with one stone because these are markets in general where there are cross-sectoral deficits, right? There's a deficit 
in the financial sector, there's a deficit in the infrastructure and the health sector, so forth. And as a citizen, as an entrepreneur living in these countries, you're very conscious of that. And you realize that to become as successful as you can, you want to be able to address as much as you can on the margin those cross-sectoral deficits. And so mobile money, to use that example again, came about for reasons because of the lack of banks uh, and particularly in, in rural areas. Well, what, ha what it has done has created a, a way of addressing the financial inclusion goal in emerging markets. And so, you know, it started out with, with, a, with a private commercial incentive in some sense, but it's had tremendous social uh, impacts for development, you know, in, in, the, in the markets in question. And, and I think, you know, I think one of the issues on, on the social impact side is, again, using mobile money as an example, but there are others, we are beginning to see a blurring of sectoral boundaries, right? And so mobile money epitomizes the case where the provider, is it a telco? Is it a bank? Is it a telco and a bank? Um, who's, you know, if you want, if there's gonna be regulation, who's gonna regulate this new animal? And it's not obvious, you know, what, 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 what the right answer is. And so that could um, have, um, you know, Social social impacts uh, beyond what you would ordinarily see in 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 the advanced countries. So I'll I'll stop there, and I'm sure uh, we'll be interested in taking questions from the audience. Thank you. So so, so we do have time for uh, for, for questions. So um, I think we've got a microphone someplace going around the room, and if you just raise your hands, we can. Is that not on? Hi, so um, Paulo Brockner from the Smith School. Uh, so the question is mostly to Samuel, but also incorporating some comments that Philip made. So uh, th this issue about company growth. I mean, companies grow, the, the, the objective should be that they would increase their margins, be more profitable. Otherwise, there is no point in growing. Uh, what we see throughout Latin America, and, and I'm talking then especially from Brazil, where I'm from, is uh, Companies are extremely profitable. So if, because of uh, competition issues, et cetera, so they, growing is like, is risky, it would involve investments, it would involve more efficiency. They are at the right size and they're extremely profitable as they are. But, uh, and you see that, I mean, uh, for example, in the late 90s, there was privatization in Brazil, opening for uh, uh, foreign competition, banking sector, for example, there was a hope that now, Banking sector in Brazil has been an oligopoly for a long time, very profitable companies. New entrants, foreign banks, after a couple of years, they accommodated. They didn't compete very strongly, they accommodated. And it seems that this structure of the so, so accommodation, and if you look then at the microstructure, the companies are very linked, the boards are very linked, every, so, so there is this old boys network that is linked. That, restricts a lot of those changes. I mean, why there is not more competition? Because the, those companies don't want more competition and they make pressures and they control a lot of the economy. So it seems that there is this, it's hard to break into the cycle because that's, so the, the, I mean, I don't know if you have looked at that, those aspects and if there are any, any data or any solutions that you would uh, suggest for that. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I think firms are behaving optimally or rationally in this sense. They 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 don't grow at the same pace as firms in other regions. Not because they they are dumb, but because they, they they are sitting on a lot of profits, right? So they don't have the incentives to do it. So actually, um, our take is that more than um, giving incentives, uh, positive incentives, in to, to put it some way, to these firms, you have to actually kind of boost competition and so on, right? And 
I think it goes beyond this, this thing. Uh, the, the, the scale of the firms goes beyond this thing about uh, having enough profits to stay at this optimal size that they have. It also goes into a lot of things that I think are, uh, that can be influenced by policy. Like I, I mentioned uh, skills, for example, and when, when presenting this, this, uh, this book, we, we run across uh, some, some uh, entrepreneurs that said, you know what, I, I have this scale because if I want to open a new plant, say, uh, I have to hire a manager and I can find a, a manager that is capable uh, trustworthy and so on and so forth because the, the if I know that if this guy is uh, cheating on me I, I cannot take him to court to court because the, the court system doesn't work it will cost me more to do that than to stay at the scale I am right now so I think the problem is very complex that's what I'm trying to say you have all the all the, the incentives for firms to stay in the in the scale they are right now and not to grow in this faster pace so what we're trying to say is we know that this unilateral or one-way one uh, policy uh, solutions do not work. They do not foster the, the growth of firms. This, this we know, that tackling one issue is not going to uh, uh, create the incentives for firms to grow. What we're saying is we're facing this big, big, difficult problem of trying to uh, boost growth in order to create the kind of jobs that preserves the social progress that Latin America has made in the last decade, and that we have to think creatively. And I think many policymakers in the region are starting to do, in the, to, to do this kind of creative, creative thinking. And they are internalizing the fact that you cannot kill two birds with the same stone, trying to uh, tackle the uh, informality problem at the same time as tackling this problem of, uh, of uh, making firms grow. So you need different different instruments to, to achieve this objective. And this is a difficult problem, for sure. I just, to, I, I just want to make one comment. I totally agree with everything you said. I mean, it's almost an analogy in the farm bill in the United States. Um, I mean, you can have a, a, a policy that subsidizes the production and consumption of corn syrup, and then you have a lot of obese people, and then you create a, a $50 million, and this is in the billions of dollars, obviously, of the subsidy and the consumption, and then you create a 50 or $100 million program, you know, run out of the White House for an exercise program, right? That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to cut the subsidy that creates the obesity. Right? And this is what we have in terms of now, obesity is not exactly what you're talking about in fat and happy, but that's, that's the, you know, there's something there, right? And you see this place after place after place. So those are those who work in entrepreneurship, um, and particularly global entrepreneurship. I mean, I've been very pleased to lead the Global Entrepreneurship Research Network at the Coffin Foundation. And I mean, I think it's great to do research on programs to support entrepreneurship and assess effectiveness and so forth and so on. I'm very happy to do that work. But we have to be a little concerned that in some places we're, we're that excuse that's given for for the maintenance of the status quo, were that $50 million or $100 million program that allows the rest of the society to ignore the structural uh, issues that are the real impediments to uh, actual long-term prosperity. Who's, who's calling? I guess you are. Yeah. So, sir, or gentlemen, the, um, you talk about policy making and some of the complexities, but to go back even a step further, before policy, you have um, cultures in individual countries that the policymakers may feel the need to um, address. Uh, in Latin America, for example, I understand there's a lot of corruption that's kind of unwieldy and difficult to control, correct me if I'm mistaken. But how do you like, change the culture that would allow the effective policies you mentioned, Mr. Alzerwald, because, you know, for example, in order to get rid of the farm bill, you have a, overcome a lot of factitious um, and traditional thinking in the Midwest about how we use farmland and the types of crops we should grow and everything else. So how do you address the cultural issue that would allow effective policies to be made? What's that? I mean, I just <laughs> said something, so. No, I mean, you're, you're from Latin America. Sure. <laughs> I think. <laughs> no, I, I, I think there is a, a cultural thing, and, 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 uh, and again, what we're um, 
doing in this book that we prepared is pointing at a problem that we have that we know it's very difficult to tackle at. Uh, and, uh, and I think there is an issue with, uh, with uh, the, the environment, like I said. And, uh, but how, I think there are a lot of entrepreneurs in Latin America, okay? There, there, there are people that are creating these bright things, like um, uh, Harry mentioned, I think emerging markets do produce a lot of things that are innovative and that they are copied in, in or, or, or uh, that are um, imported to, by, by um, developed countries. The issue is a, an issue of mass, right? There are some very good entrepreneurs, but we didn't have as many as probably we need to create these kind of uh, well-paid uh, jobs and so on. So I think uh, it's a difficult problem, but I, I think it can be achieved. And like uh, uh, Philip mentioned, I think environments do play a role, but these are not the, the only thing that matter, right? You, you, you do have these entrepreneurs that overcome these problems of corruption and lack of contractual certainty and so on and so forth. So I think uh, it's kind of a big push problem, but, but it can be done. That's my, my take. And, and um, I mean, as you're saying that, I mean, I guess I, I, you know, Iqbal and I started this journal, Innovations, uh, because we really both believe in the power of narrative and culture, and also because we believe that uh, the data and the uh, the analytic techniques to study the topics that we're focused on today just mostly don't exist. So the best reports we can get on what is happening and sort of the entrepreneurial frontier is to get to get actual stories back, analytically rigorously considered reports back from the people who are really creating the future around the world. So that's what the point of Innovations Journal is. Um, I, I think it's deeply important to invest in, 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 in new narratives to really support the, 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 the creation of an environment where there can be kind of new heroes that, that come up and that you sort of that change the discussion around what success is in a particular country. Um, I mean, there's a survey done of young people in Karachi by one of my uh, colleagues at George Mason, it's really the first uh, you know, sort of large scale survey in Karachi of, of youth attitudes um, that, 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 that I, I believe has been done. But anyway, it was just a couple of years ago. And it found two things. Things. One, that they, young people in, in, in Karachi view the number one problem in Pakistan of um, energy you know, um, issues, uh, uh, um, you, you know, corruption issues, all that stuff. Uh, sorry, sorry, um, and, and, and uh, violence and all the sort of things we think about um, were there, but the number one was corruption. No, corruption was the number one issue as far as young people impeding the progress of the country. And then they asked them what their preferred career path was, where they saw themselves going, and they said the civil service. Right? So, I mean, if you know where the money is, that's where you want to go. And so, so I think to the extent that you, and now there are unbelievable, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurs in Pakistan, uh, you know, Monis Rahman, um, you know, who, and, and, and Seema Aziz, and I mean, really world-class entrepreneurs, and telling their stories and kind of getting that out, I think it can be part of a long-term cultural shift, but it's, it's not, it's not uh, easy. And we need it in the United States, too. This is why we created the National Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Hi, I was just going to make a comment based upon his question. My name is April Williams, and I'm with the governor's office in the state of Maryland. And it was kind of, you kind of stole my thunder, but it was good. Um, but I was basically going to state that I think it's important that when we're trying to change these systems that we empower uh, these entrepreneurs. I was an entrepreneur in the state of Maryland for five years. And it, the amazing things happen when you begin to get one person together and then that one person goes out and get gets another person. So whether that's here in the States or, or across across the world, once they begin, kind of like you were saying, to, to, to hear about successes, uh, you begin to, like you said, change the narrative. And I think that when you change the narrative, then people start voting in new leaders um, who have um, that concept of, of that change narrative. And then slowly but surely, um, things, I believe, begin to, to change. Thank you all for your wonderfully inspiring remarks. Uh, I have a question, and any one of the panelists uh, may take it. Uh, it's about a phenomenon that's trending right now, and that's the idea of these innovation contests. So the thinking is, you know, if we institutionalize these innovation contests and we have lots of them, we'll have a hotbed of entrepreneurial activity. And going back to your point, Philip, about not having enough data on outcomes, 
I wonder if you can give us any insight into how successful these innovation contests are. Uh, are there just opportunities for people to come and share ideas, or do we have any understanding that these do, in fact, lead to uh, sustainable industries or innovations that are, in some ways, commercialized? I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by the, this notion of a, of a, of a contest, because as an economist, I think the market is the contest. So I'm trying to understand what is the innovation contest, what's the reward there, is it, is it you know, some nominal kind of recognition and therefore you make, you're signaling the market? Yeah, uh, so I mean in this area, for example, you throw a stone and you'll hit an innovation contest around, you know, mobile health technologies or uh, whatever, uh, you know, whatever's trending right now, big data analytics or how to use mm -hmm. smartphones uh, for various kinds of things. So in some ways, it is an opportunity for people to come together and showcase their products and ideas. Um, there are nominal prizes, but the question always is, these are nascent ideas, and do they go any further than those innovation contests? So, so there's a kind of convergence of three things happening. Um, one is um, the whole world, uh, which is not quite the context, but related, of prediction markets. And so you have Nate Silver, and he you know, is, he popularized this, but another colleague of mine, George Mason, Robin Hansen, uh, was working on this uh, you know, a decade and a half ago. And, 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 and the book, uh, you know, James Theoretic, wisdom of crowds and you know sort of talking about uh, how when you aggregate uh, the knowledge of the crowd you, you actually have a lot of information the other is um, the you know incentive sort of pioneering this notion of, of, of crowdsource problem solving that's not about entrepreneurship but but it, you know it is a very powerful idea which is that 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 you have sort of a tail of problem solvers or, or a distribution of problem solvers and in uh, along sort of the you know going from most elite to least elite um, uh, from uh, you know left to right where it's sort of the general Public at the far right, um, you know, the closest to the to, to the axis is the MITs, the Stanfords, or whatever. And the probability of getting a solution from the MITs and Stanfords uh, and the University of Maryland uh, is 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 higher, is higher, right? It's quite a bit higher. Um, but if you, but it's not as many people. Right? And if you take the, the entire mass of possible solutions and you integrate over everything that's not elite, there are actually more good solutions in the rest of the distribution than there is in, in, in the elite part of the distribution. So, so what Innocentive does is open up these. They have all kinds of evidence, and it's very powerful a, at this point. And Kareem Lakani at the Harvard Business School has done a lot of work on this, uh, you know, really rigorous and, and, and very informative work. So there's, there's really not too much doubt at this point that that basic premise works. The question is, how much does it have to do with entrepreneurship? And so a colleague of mine uh, named Ahmad Ashkar has been running the Holt Prize. It's the world's largest business plan competition. The thing about the Holt Prize is that it's, it's, it is, it is, I mean, the market is the test. There's no question about that. But is there an environment short of, of full exposure to the rigors and discipline of the market that can give um, uh, you teams of people an opportunity to get some kind of discipline to their ideas? And as to whether this actually works or not, I think it's an open question. But I think what really matters, what's important for any prize, and I think the NSN of experience has really borne this out, it's about what you do with the losers. It's not about the winners. The winners is the inducement. But, but I mean, Netflix has done a great job of this. Netflix is the best on this, which is essentially pooling the, the sort of losing teams in, in iterated steps to sort of say, well, you had this piece and you had this piece. You guys should get together, right? And having those horizontal platforms to integrate the losers. So if you're creating a prize competition, it is, it is essentially about how you integrate the, 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 the knowledge resources and the relational resources of the losers. It's not about the winners. The winners will be fine. But I, so, I mean, the word, we don't have the data. It's a fascinating question. It integrates some very significant trends. I take it very seriously, but I don't think we know about the overall effectiveness yet. I mean, I, 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 just, just to sort of piggyback on what I was saying earlier. I mean, I, it sounds like these innovation contests, and you know, I now understand what you're talking about. This is sort of the middleman, right? Why yeah. pay, why pay uh, retail when you can go wholesale? And so the whole notion of crowdsourcing, of financial, you know, people who have a, an interest in investing, you, 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 you know, this, the winner takes all kinds of notion of these contests becomes, you know, a, a red herring if, you know, someone who doesn't have the greatest idea doesn't get quite as much money, uh, you know, th that's a market-driven solution. I just don't, I, I, you know, I, the scarce resources that we have, uh, I would argue, should not be devoted to innovation contests and just figure out how to match, 
you know, investors with people who have good ideas. But that's, that's my idea. Yeah. The, the whole problem is finding the people with good ideas. And systems still are not equitable in terms of how they distribute opportunities to access the networks in terms of good ideas. So.